COP28 is the 28th United Nations Climate Change Conference being held at Expo City, Dubai. Some of the key objectives of COP28 include measures to reduce emissions, notably through a commitment to triple global renewable energy capacity by 2030 and phasing out carbon dioxide emitting fossil fuels. As world leaders across the private and public sector convene at the United Nations COP28 Climate Summit to discuss achieving a low carbon future, South African statesmen and private sector heavyweights take with them key outcomes that will affect the future of climate strategy for business, civil society, citizens and the economy of the country for years to come. We need to mobilize more funding in a much greater scale. We must launch the work program on national and international just transitions that involve all of society and encompass all areas of the economy. What is decided here at COP28 needs to be guided by science, it needs to be underpinned by equity, and the principle of common but differentiated responsibilities and respective capabilities. Climate action is key to South Africa's sustainable development agenda. The South African government has just approved the implementation plan for our country's just energy transition investment plan. This plan focuses on areas critical to a just transition, including investment in electricity infrastructure, new energy vehicles, that is electric vehicles, green hydrogen, skills development, as well as municipal electricity distribution, and other interventions directed at communities most affected by the energy transition. South Africa has a very successful renewable energy program that plays a key role in supporting our decarbonization efforts. There are also promising developments underway in our country to harness the potential of green hydrogen and to beneficiate critical minerals as well as rare earths in support of development and driving the green transition. The South African Pavilion, recently launched in Dubai United Arab Emirates at COP28, showcases the effects of multi-sector collaboration in Africa while exhibiting the mutually beneficial relationship that exists between government and the National Business Initiative in the fight against climate change. It's not a question of just this community or that community or this ecosystem and that ecosystem, but it all must eventually filter up into a policy, um, which then that policy comes to forums like this, where the negotiators can use, um, if, they, if they hit a problem, then they can say, well, look, actually we've done research into this area, that area, and you might find this useful. So, I mean, an example which we've dealt with in the last day, we had the President of COP talking about the fact that there's no science underpinning the phase out of fossil fuels. <clears throat> now, Im immediately what anybody should be doing is saying, okay, well, he says there's no science. He'd be saying, well, are you saying this entire edifice is built on a figment of the imagination? No, it's not. It's built on science and that science has filtered its way up to here and people are using science for, to make real decisions about real futures sure. um, that we all face. And in the conservation field, which is what OGRC deals with, um, it's the same principle, is we all live in place, we all live in an environment, we use ecosystem services. Um, so our very, we talk about the existential threat of climate change, but we exist within an ecosystem. And um, so that's that's really what, what, what OGRC looks at. We always come to COP with hope. <laughs> and uh, the fact that the loss and damage fund was approved on the first day, a big decision like that on the first day, gives us hope. We will see as time goes on 
whether we are able to sustain that that hope and whether we are able to rebuild trust. But the mandate is always going to be what are some of the you know, hard questions, hard solutions that we must be able to tackle when it comes to climate change, um, loss of uh, biodiversity as well as loss of habitat. And if we look at that collaboratively, then surely we should, should come to a consensus as all the different stakeholders. So it's not just about one person or one you know, particular stream saying that I'm benefiting the most or I'm hurt the most. It's about Africans coming together to, ha to have African solutions. Um, and that's the, the crux of what we do. We fund that research in order um, for people, communities, um, and places to have a, you know, a future. Um, we work with an entity called uh, Future Ecosystems of Africa because that's where we're thinking. We're thinking not just about the now, but the cost of the future. If we don't, um, you know, if we don't focus on you know, climate transition and climate mitigation now, what is the cost of that in the future? What does that look like for Africa? And so uh, at times, you know, we find that different entities are, uh, are pulling their own agendas but we as an organization, and I think it's quite big and what amazing that I've been hearing it throughout the conference is that the idea of collaboration is something that different you know, talks and discussions and plenaries and, um, are starting to, to think about more deeply. And that excites us because we are big on collaboration. Um, we fund researchers, so by the virtue of that, uh, the work isn't necessarily produced by us, but it's produced through the work and the networks and the partnerships that we build. So collaboration is at the core of what we do. Um, and I'm quite excited that this is something, collaboration is a word that we're hearing quite often because it means then we're not starting, we're not thinking as silos, we're thinking as, um, as one. And our combined issue, our universal issue, is, is climate change. The Just Energy Transition Investment Plan, also known as JIP, is an 8.5 billion US dollar deal to help South Africa transition to a low carbon economy. The plan was announced at COP26 in 2021. It is a collaboration between the governments of South Africa, France, Germany, the United Kingdom, the United States, and the European Union. This transition is difficult. This transition is significant. But we've decided that we would not shy away from it because it is difficult. And we've been clear that we've got to work with all of the partners in finding solutions around this. And so even if you look into our Just Transition uh, plan, it's focused on drawing on board our own employees, the communities around us, our shareholders, uh, our suppliers, all of these people have a vested interest in a successful transition and we committed uh, to that. And so if you look more at what we've been doing, we're able to say to our, to our shareholders, our commitment is unambiguous. It's reflected, as I've indicated, if we said you're going to bring on board 1.2 gigawatts of renewables and you already have signed up uh, over, over uh, 600 megawatts of, of renewable. That's a, a reflection of our commitment. If we say that we could start shifting into new value pools and we have begun to show, as I've indicated, with this uh, proof of concept in Sasselbeck, that we can do something about green hydrogen. But of course, to meet the expectations that we have around green hydrogen, there's more that's required both in respect of, um, of, of, uh, of renewable energy, but equally the lowering of costs in respect of the cost of, uh, kilo, of a kilogram of, re, of, uh, of, 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 of hydrogen. And part of doing that is about equally ensuring that there is greater investments that lower the cost of electrolyzers. So those are some of the things that have to be factored in by all of our partners that when you're dealing with the transition for the hard to abate industries, it's not really going to be the same as for others who are not actually having to deal with transitions that impact 
equally their processes. We know that the private sector with, without uh, government support is investing in renewable energy in our country. I mean, I'm, I'm responsible in, in our department for environmental authorizations and uh, we know that there's uh, 58 gigawatts of renewable energy projects that, that are in the pipeline. That doesn't mean all of them will reach financial close and it doesn't mean that all of them will be put on the grid. But this is private sector investment. So I think that there's lots of, of uh, private sector participation in the renewable generation. I think that, that where the, the jet P money comes in is we are looking at, at aspects of the transition that uh, have higher degree of risk that require first loss, that need grant financing. And um, obviously one of the important things is to, to have a register of projects so that everybody can see who's getting money. There, there is built into the program a monitoring and evaluation process. And, and I know that South Africans are always concerned that, that money would go out the back door. And I think that's why we've been focusing also on the architecture and the accountability architecture so that there, there should be uh, confidence that these projects will in fact be implemented and that uh, things should not go astray. We know that on the issues that we're dealing with at COP28, there's no way that any one actor can go it alone. And so if we look at that, firstly, it's our partnership with the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment that's critical in enabling us to co-host the South African Pavilion here. And that collaboration with government and business that goes back a few years is a really exciting one. And I think a fairly unique one in the context of COP and the hosting of pavilions. And what it has done over the last few years is allowed, firstly, to have a home base. Mm -hmm. So if you're in the pavilion, you'll feel that it's buzzing, it feels like home. It's a place for, you know, whoever's visiting COP from our South African delegation and if not from the delegation to just come and have a base and that's the first thing is a, is a sense of togetherness uh, it's a place that brings together people that you wouldn't ordinarily find in the same space back home and that is one of the beautiful things is that ability to really collaborate come together have conversations meet people you otherwise wouldn't have and to do that in the context of this common goal that we have which is to really enable our country to be able to activate a just transition and to do that in a way that is meaningful for all people that, and that is actually viable for everybody to be able to do. So the space allows for the conversations to happen, like I said, with actors that wouldn't traditionally be found in the same place, but also an opportunity to showcase the various efforts of businesses because the pavilion has an ongoing schedule of events. I think over the, the short period of time we're hosting close to over 60 events at the pavilion and that's allowing companies to showcase what they've done, to have critical and meaningful conversations but obviously not just our companies, there are a number of different types of events that are happening at the platform from various actors that really surface a variety of viewpoints and so what we're doing is widening the mind in terms of the ability to understand multiple viewpoints and how those are critical in the transition. As we're speaking, there's a conversation now happening on the, the Just Energy Transition Investment Plan, on, sorry, the Implementation Plan, and Mr. Creasy has spoken, we've got the, the Project Management Unit on there, we've got business on there, we've got civil society representatives, and again, the voices coming together to say, well, what does this mean for us? So we've got this, you know, at this point, just over $11 billion that has flowed in terms of the International Partners Group and the climate funding financing that's come through. What are we doing with that money? Uh, what is really exciting is it's a platform to be able to, for government to talk about the transparency measures that they're putting in place in relation to how that money is going to be spent, for civil society to voice their views on what's going to happen and how they would like to see that money being spent and what the constraints might be, and for business, of course, to say that, you know, we need to access some of that to be able to leverage and to be able to make that shift uh, in a more affordable manner. Uh, because the burden should never sit on any one player. So those are the things that we're seeing happening at the pavilion. We're of course hugely grateful to business because it played a big role in sponsoring it. As you can imagine, it's not a cheap thing to be able to put together to host a pavilion like this sure. at COP. Especially in Dubai. <laughs> Especially in Dubai. The first joint pavilion was at COP23 in Bonn, Germany, which took place on November 2017. The aim of the pavilion is to stem climate risks while bolstering 
on economic opportunities that can boost resilience and create jobs. I believe or we believe that first and foremost the ecosystems that decarbonization brings are actually quite exciting. So I, I take for example the hydrogen ecosystem and the potential that that presents for countries in Southern Africa like South Africa, Namibia as, as, as a couple of examples. Because you know when you look at the natural endowment in terms of wind on the west coast and the abundance in terms of solar and sun density. It's quite immense. And then if you then start to think about, you know, the ability to convert that into renewable electricity, into hydrogen, and then further downstream processing, you know, you start to create a whole new industry in its own right. Which is why, for example, we are participants in terms of the hydrogen um, valley uh, initiatives. And we are also engaging in discussions with you know, um, the Northern Cape through the Premier's office and obviously the Namibian government. So, so, so that potentially brings, you know, a whole host of job opportunities and new industries, you know, both upstream and downstream. So that's quite exciting. Given, obviously, you know, um, the fact that we are transitioning to more use of technology, we have to skill our people. But the resultant, though, is higher skilled jobs which are higher paying, um, which in itself is something to be excited about. You've also got the element, and we're already seeing it, for example, for example, at our mines. Um, I'll use the example of autonomous drilling, where we're taking people out of the, the, the coal face, as it were, into control rooms, operating these via remote control. Again, it results in a much a, a more sustainable and a better standard of job and people are learning skills that are quite portable that they can take to other industries beyond 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 just mining i think the challenge here fifi though is 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 around engaging with our stakeholders you know both obviously our employees you know service providers community government civil society in really understanding you know how you know this technology uplift and advancement and these new greener you know ecosystems the opportunity that they provide so there's a lot of education here as well but of course it's got to be two-way providing the inputs and, and clearly we are determined to take everybody along with us. This is, is a collective action, right? And it's what NBI does. And we're getting tremendous support from our member companies to do this work and to do it right, because that's what's important, right? We don't want to be focusing on supply all the time. We, we have to focus both on supply and demand. And we've seen collaboration from both private sector and government and industry. We've got industry partners that are, you know, part of this initiative who are supporting the process. Because, you know, the industry partners their members own the opportunities, they are the opportunity holders. And as we know, particularly with township-based SMEs, access to market is still a big issue. There's still a big gap between township-based SMEs accessing formal opportunities. And so working together is us trying to close that gap and saying, how do we, if you're looking for SMEs, we know where you can find them. And it's through the IRM hubs, which we have assisted in facilitating. And these IRM hubs, by the way, are situated within the Tivet College. So they're right in the middle of a township um, within a Tivet College. Because we believe that Tivet Colleges are, are, are the perfect intermediary between demand and supply. And, and that is where we are able to then also drive demand-led skilling and respond to what the market wants. So there's definitely a willingness. As the world moves to a low carbon future by 2030, this transition stands to impact key sectors that are historically carbon intensive, such as the gas and mining industries. The, 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 the ultimate aspiration is for us to pivot towards 1.5 degrees, you know, um, and of course that was the, Pir uh, the Paris uh, uh, Climate Accord. Um, Clearly, you know, as, as the mining industry, we have a significant role to play in that. And that is effectively, you know, the access to the metals and minerals that are required. The essential question, though, is that how is that going to come about? Because a decarbonized world is probably six times more minerals and metals intensive than a non-decarbonized. And if you then consider the fact that from discovery, to permitting and to first dig 
developing a mind can take the best part of about 15 to 20 years in an environment as well where there's a challenge for access to capital. Um, the, 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 the conversations that we've been having is to get obviously participants within the COP, whether it's governments, whether it's bankers, whether it's NGOs, to really appreciate that, you know, there's, um, there's um, a, a massive challenge that has to be overcome, which will require significant collaboration to, to, to make it through. So, so probably one of the biggest challenges is how do you get six times the amount of copper that you require? How do you get five times the amount of steel that you require? That's the challenge, but that's also the opportunity as well. We, we certainly are taking our own role very seriously. We do appreciate the complexity of the challenge um, affecting hard to abate industries like the ones we we in. Um, at the same time, we believe that uh, the commitments we've made are themselves significant. They are requiring a stretch on us. They are making a significant, a significant contribution to the nationally determined contributions for South Africa. And we remain on track. Uh, we do believe that we'll be able to meet them. And of course, it's always a balancing act of being able to do so in a way that is affordable, uh, that can be enabled, and, and we keep on checking a number of scenarios around how best that can be enabled. But we do believe that uh, the NDC we have uh, is reasonable, but, and, and the key thing is it's, not so, it's got to be important that we're not given a much more tougher challenge relative to the other societies. Uh, it can't be the Global South having to bear the burden of enabling everybody to meet their commitments when it in fact is probably contributing proportionately less uh, uh, than, than other parts of the globe. But our commitment hasn't changed in relation to our, our, our contribution and we believe we can work with all of the partners within the NBI including the state and as well as non-state actors uh, to address the challenge. When we're looking at the implementation plan, you know, which has today been, uh, is being discussed, there is absolutely going to have to be a role for business because a lot of the projects that are going to ensure that we can do the transition that are going to go into the new economy are going to have to be led by business in some way or form. There are obviously some that are more the community focused and things like that, but business is going to have to enable in the longer term because that is going to be the industries of the future. That's not government, you know. Government can use that to help create the enabling environment, make sure that we're dealing with, the, especially the justice issues overall, but finding the right ways in which that money can deploy to be catalytic and allow for businesses to then come in because what you ultimately want to do is to transition the economy mm. and that's what we're really trying to do and at the heart of that and making sure that there's uptake for employment is largely going to be business going into the future mm. so when we look at that the role of business now I think is really going to be about engaging on what some of that looks like I mean one of the key areas there so you're talking about the priority areas in the jet implementation plan and that again is solar it's EVs there's green hydrogen in there and there's cross-cutting areas like skills that go across again government doesn't go it alone the skills that we need need to be employable skills the input of the private sector to ensure that those are employable in the sectors that are being grown is absolutely critical also we end up in a situation where we spend a lot of money we develop skills that are not employable or that are not future fit and that really poses a double whammy particularly on our youth mm -hmm. and so ensuring that private sector is engaged up front sure. to understand and to help inform those things and to help create the infrastructure that is accessible um, factor that into their own training and development plans for example is going to be critical secondly is that on the types of projects that the money is going to be deployed into how do we make sure that that is catalytic? Mm -hmm. Could we do things that are that first stage that kind of take maybe a first loss or help with just getting that first startup going and then after that it can move? Again, you know, there's a role for business to play there. Apart from just understanding the type of business itself, but things like mentorship, growth development, understanding that, um, you know, helping things go into different areas, they have to, we have to approach this as a partnership. A big part of that is making sure that business 
comes up, is present at the table, is owning, I think, both the responsibility but also those opportunities that are sitting in playing a leading role in shaping the South Africa we want to see. And that's one that is, it's, it's sustainable, it's inclusive, um, it starts to realise emerging opportunities and it translates, I think, uh, this journey that we've travelled as a country into something that is a, a reality uh, and a reality that we want to see. Um, so in terms of what we do, we, we implement you know, projects across several categories. An important one, as I mentioned, around the leadership space, so leadership platforms. Uh, we did work recently around the Just Transition Pathways and really thinking about how we need to respond to uh, some of the, the, the transition risks that's, you know, the risks that are coming up as a result of climate change as our, you know, our markets, the trade partners change the way that they are conducting business and we have to respond to those huge global you know, changes, those huge global drivers. So there's a big element there where um, there's a competitiveness issue that we're responding to and we did work on defining how we start to shift the South African economy in a way that is responsive to the challenges that we face as a country to those needs that we need to respond to but also start to realize to see the opportunities and to tap into those great resources that we have so the pathways work then charted how we would transition our economy to a net zero one so really trying to eliminate emissions as far as possible across key sectors um, and we did that in a systematic way we brought in business to really own that journey and to start to identify the opportunities in their own spaces and understand how you transition entire businesses but also those value chains the people the communities the youth um, as we start to shift and we brought in government because we also need to be thinking about you know, the policy architecture that's going to set this country up to be very competitive going forward as the biggest climate event of the year COP28 concludes after a year of extreme weather events in which many climate records have been broken, African countries have started to realize with a sense of urgency that decarbonization and mitigation of fossil fuels on the African continent can help address a number of pressing issues, including the impact on health, agriculture, water and biodiversity. The unanimous call to combat the effects of climate change resonate stronger than ever as the globe transitions to a world filled with cleaner energy for all.